I'm not doing the best, I have to be honest. I'm um, going to dive on right deep onto some what we're post United drawing nil nil, right? Nil nil, zero zero against Man City at home off the back of getting knocked out in the Champions League and generally having a poor run of form at home, innit? I think we've won one or one, yeah, with West Brom lost five or, you know, with the exception of obviously the Man City. Of course, we've been able to turn some games around away from home, but our home record has been terrible. Um, and then, of course, considering how poor we were against um, Red Bull Leipzig, you just would have... Forget... Um, it's a derby, right? So you're assuming two teams who have probably started off the season a bit slow would want to come into this game trying to... Especially in City's case, because we've obviously got you know knocked out of the Champions League, you would assume that City would come into this game wanting to... Um, put us to the sword really right take us apart absolutely bully us but that didn't really happen if anything they were more worried about our threats on the counter than they were worried about trying to score or trying to pull us apart like they usually do um not much, i didn't really see many combinations from them if anything i only saw i only saw that kind of classic signature man city attack where they sort of do the whole little pullback on the left hand side with kdb or left hand side with with sterling and whoever i saw him do that once the little one two where he sort of passes it inside um runs and then gets it back again in the box i saw it happen only once against aaron basaka even though aaron basaka probably had his you know he's been in a poor run of form in general so this was definitely the game to kind of go at him um and yeah, it was a really cagey affair, very cagey affair, very tense. If anything, maybe Man City could say they probably might have deserved to win on the strength of the chances created. But I think we had a pretty clear chance in Rashford where he sort of missed a shot. Um, there was a chance where Rashford didn't really get onto the end of it. There was a chance where we could have had a penalty that got ruled out for offside. But apart from that, we didn't really fashion anything, right? We didn't really test the goalkeeper. I think if I actually look at the stats here, right? No, no. What shots on target? We had uh, two, there was two shots on target from, bo from both teams. Two shots on target, right? Which is maddening to considering that it's a derby. Um, but again, it might illustrate just where we're at in terms of respective teams. I guess with Pep Guardiola, he's been questioned a lot. Um, they haven't really been playing um, at a vintage uh, Pep Guardiola Man City team level. Um, people are questioning whether or not he's kind of um, exhausted his players because he seems to have that tendency, right? When he comes into clubs, he revolutionizes them. He whips them all into shape. He gets them playing a fast, attacking, pressing style of football. But there's only so much you can do. There's, from what I've read, there's only so much of that you can do to play. So the same group of players, you have to keep freshening it up. Um, th that message will kind of fall on deaf ears after a certain time, and they will obviously get like a days once they're winning trophies. They're you know kind of resting their laurels. So you've seen that happen. You know I feel like in the last two seasons, and especially with Liverpool, just you know leaps and bounds better than anybody else in the league. It's tough to really. It's tough to judge him accurately because you know. Liverpool are so much better than everybody else, but it's also not up to his kind of lofty standards of what he's done prior. So it's a fair assessment to kind of put out there. But in general, yeah, man, like what a bad game from us, especially. Um, lineup wise, I wasn't that disappointed with who we lined up with. I have to be honest. Um, not timeline lineup here. Um, I think for the most part, the only change I would have made for United was maybe replacing Shaw for Tellez. I'm a big believer in having attacking fullbacks, really stretching the pitch, uh, providing some essential, providing some um, attacking impetus when we're going forward. And obviously being the start or the kind of ignition to when we hit teams on a counter-attack, especially if we're playing three players in the midfield in a sort of a diamond formation, you have all that space on the outside here to kind of exploit. It'd be nice to kind of get some attacking fullbacks sort of bombing forward that, again, doesn't necessarily happen with United, even though we've got a pretty stellar fullback in um, um, Alex Tellers who can probably do that, but I guess Solskjaer isn't really sold on him just yet and he hasn't settled into a team and all that malarkey. Um, Shaw seems to be the obvious op option at all times at left back, even though he doesn't offer much at all outside of maybe being a half decent defender. And even that he's not that great at, but I have to give him credit in this game. I thought he played pretty well. I was pretty worried about him when Ferran Torres come on, but he marshaled him pretty well. Most of the game he kept Riyad Mahrez pretty quiet. Um, if anything, most of the threat came on our right, uh, Man City's left. I think Aaron Bissaka was, you know, getting spun a few times by Sterling. But again, there's no shame in that because Sterling's one of the best um, attacking forwards we have in a league at the moment. So that's not really anything to be ashamed about. Um, and then the rest of the team, yeah, I would have picked him. Um, I think Fred coming in as a defensive playmaker made a defensive midfielder it made sense. He's probably the best we have in our club at the moment, even though he's kind of, you know, not the standard that we possibly need to kind of really 
um, mount a challenge for a title, all that malarkey. McTominay and Pogba, and then Fred in front with Greenwood and Rashford. So again, so Lallabar, I'm not that mad at. McTominay, I don't really rate as a player, as a football player, but I like what he gives up in terms of discipline, in terms of shape, and in terms of just aggression, right? He's always up for a Manchester Derby, always up for most games. Um, and his overall um, professionalism, if you could call that, and up for up forwardness kind of I think helps to kind of give the team a bit of balance and because he's not you know good at all the flashy stuff he lets all the other players express themselves so I wasn't too mad at that um but yeah man um Pogba as well playing a bit further forward that was an interesting one because Pogba played like it felt like he even played a bit further forward than Rashford on the left he was really high up but that was great to see um and if if we're being honest Pogba probably was the best player in that midfield again it's it, we're really clutching at straws because it was a terrible game no one really played that well but if we're being honest Pogba probably offered more threat and was probably more dangerous and had, and picked up some more interesting positions overall than Bruno Fernandes is and Bruno Fernandes had one of those performances that you kind of a lot of these fanboys don't really want to admit, but he does this quite often. If he's not scoring penalties and if he's not scoring decisive goals, usually game, you know, in in real time, this is how Bruno Fernandes plays. He's always attempting the Hollywood pass, always doing the flicks and tricks. And when those things don't come off, the little flicks around the corner, he can look very average. He doesn't really look after the ball well. Um, and it's okay if you've got a team that sort of like recycles the ball really well. Like I think about it, I think about a little, li maybe a little bit like um, Aston Villa, kind of, right? With Grealish, where they kind of recycle the ball and always have like an outlet to kind of give it to Grealish or give it to McGinn, right? Those are sort of like the outlets to sort of like carry the ball further up the pitch. When Barkley's fit, of course, he does the same thing. But you have to kind of um, coach your side to just 100% de depend on one player and of course I'm you know at United's level we just can't do that because of the level of opposition we come against and the level of tactics used you can't just you know play through one player you have to sort of diversify your points of attack so when Bruno isn't performing it's really obvious to see he's not performing because he's trying all those things that usually work you know once here or twice especially against the lesser teams and if they don't work against the better teams he's kind of quiet and we did have pretty one of his quiet games but then saying that he, he played a ball into Rashford if Rashford would have controlled, that would have been a goal, probably, if it was one-on-one. -on -one. And then he also was responsible, did he? No, did he cross the ball? No, I don't think he crossed the ball into Rashford that won the penalty. He might have, I'm not too sure. But he would have probably taken the penalty. So imagine, those two chances, he would have either got an assist for a winning goal, because I think this match was, there was only ever going to be one goal in it, or he would have taken a penalty. So that's why sometimes it can be... I wouldn't say he's stat pads, because I don't think that's fair, but I do think people don't really look at... Bruno Fernandes um, performance level in the game from an honest point of view standing back as an actual football player they just look at the stats he scored a winner he created these chances but when you actually watch him like he's a bit frustrating man he's not the best I don't think and he's I would never play him as a number 10 personally if that was up to me and I was a coach I would always deploy him as like a number eight right a quasi number eight slash number six i think that's where he's actually would be of more of a threat because of his tenacity in the midfield he kind of gets her after it and um, obviously he releases the ball very quickly for those positions i think that's where he'd be at he'd be more use in my opinion in that regard and then you'd play an actual creative midfielder a bit more uh, maybe in front of him which is why the Pogba thing worked because i think Pogba was the one that was able to like kind of carry the ball be a bit more cute be a bit more um uh purposeful and sort of like you know aware of his surroundings like he played well that that again it's not a 10 out of 10 performance with Pogba it was probably like a six or a seven player rating but he was a, a far better but overall I don't know my overall disappointing match I think um if you're Ole Gunnar Solskjaer I get it I think he was extremely worried about not losing this game to a high margin he didn't like I think ever since we lost to Spurs 6-1 Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has never been the same again and I think our tactics have suffered somewhat he's really worried about um, getting absolutely blitzed again by a good team. And of course, he's very worried about losing his job, ultimately, which is understandable, right? He's got his dream job in Man in United. And I am of the belief that if he does eventually, when he eventually gets taxed from Man United, I don't think he's going to be able to find another job in the Premier League. I think it's a bang average coach who probably got away with murder for the most part because we've been so poor for the last few years. He was a real breath of fresh air after Mourinho came in. So it was kind of, um, a, it kind of made sense to hire him at the time because there was no, other, no one else available. Um, especially 
since I think at that time Pochettino was still on gardening leave, he couldn't actually get a job, um, or he'd um, he'd kind of nullify his um, compensation from Tottenham. So the obvious choice was out. I think um, Allegri wasn't in the picture too, so it kind of made sense to just give it to Oli because you know he restored the good feeling. He was at the wheel, quote unquote, blah blah blah. But when it comes to really the top level and that's going to win stuff, like you know, I don't think any honest man, if I can sit there and say they really think that Oli is going to be the one to lift us a Premier League title or a Champions League. I don't, if, especially Champions League, it's not going to happen this season is it so we're going to have to compete for the top four which is going to be difficult and then we're going to have to try and and then that's what trying to have a title charge with this current manager in place who plays seven defenders against Red Bull Leipzig right five at the back two defensive midfielders and still concedes the goal in the first two minutes like I don't know man I don't know but again pretty boring match no real detail no, nothing to really pull out of this I can't really make any more comment it was what it was isn't it look at the stats like there's nothing else to say here um supposedly 11 shots uh we had 11 shots to man city's nine two shots on target for each uh, man city just shaded the possession of 54 percent passes just a bit more than us i guess just over just over 70 over sorry yeah over 70 for for them pass accuracy 86 84 for us fouls committed 13 for us six for them yellow cards one each and yeah pretty nothing game we are now way in the table. We're now one point ahead of them, I guess. We're eighth, they're ninth. And this is a very fair reflection of just how poor of a season has been for both teams, I think, going forward. Obviously, I think Man City would be... I think if, if you told a Man City fan, oh, you're going to win the Champions League and you're going to finish fifth, they'd be... Or, I don't know, sixth, whatever. They'd be more than happy. I think that's the real um, gap in their trophy cabinet. That's the real good marker, I think, for Pep in terms of what's his legacy actually remembered as. Because I think at the time when he came into City, there were leaps and bounds in front of everybody. He got he got an open checkbook to do what he wanted. And, you know, he was able to kind of take a clean sweep at the league with no real competition. The moment he had one, a bit of competition and he had an actual world-class coach come in, in Klopp with uh, resources and a belief in what he's trying to do he kind of floundered he hasn't really had an answer ever since so I think if he's able to kind of pick up a Champions League medal a Champions League trophy sorry at the end of the season I think it's going to be a successful season for them lot and for us in the Europa League we go in it like who gives a shit we won it already I don't care about the competition um it's long we play on Thursdays then back on again on like look how tired we look now right we looked really tired today. Supposedly, um, the tiredness is to do with us playing in midweek, which I don't really, you know, I'm not, I don't really believe that's true. But let's let's imagine that's actually a fact. We're tired because we played in midweek. Okay, cool. We're tired because we played in midweek. Now we have to play. <laughs> now we have to play. Now we have to play um, on Thursdays and on the weekends. Just imagine that. On Thursdays, on the weekends, we're playing. On Thursdays and on the weekends. Like an absolute horror show of a situation. I'm not really happy or looking forward to it. But hey, it is what it is, isn't it? We are where we are. This is the modern day United. This is how we stand. And um, yeah, man. What can we do? What can we do? Anyway, moving on. What else? Let's see what else they said, actually. Let's hear what the um, reaction has been from the pundits and stuff. So this is from Twitter. We've got here the response from Main United Zone, kind of clipping up some of the uh, responses from some of the people behind after the game manager and stuff. So you've got here uh, a quote. You've got Manchester United have failed to score in three home league games this season, one more than in the whole of 2019 campaign at Old Trafford. God almighty, great stat, that one. Solskjaer after the game quoted saying, in my time against City, this is the best performance we've had and not the best result. I just sometimes sometimes I give up. Like I think Stephen Housen from Stratford Paddock says a lot. And whenever Oli Gunnar Solskjaer says something stupid, he'd be like, "Oh, don't listen to the manager. He's just you know he's he's kid his kidology. He's just trying to you know divert attention away from the performance. Um, don't listen to what he says. Right, just watch what you do on the pitch. But it's hard not to listen to what he says when he's a United coach and he comes out absolute frass on a daily basis. He sounds like such an amateur. He sounds like such a um nonsense things that he says just don't make any sense like why would you say this is the like what's w there's no pride in the fact that you think this is our best performance because we drew nil nil we had two shots on target we never looked like we were going to score we played with the handbrake on we obviously went into that game not wanting to get beat like that was a primary sort of rationale behind it um <sighs> 
and then you go and then you go you, you think a bit further you think to yourself the actual game that was actually you know influenced how Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was remembered and probably dictate as to whether or not he keeps his job was against Rebel Leipzig we had to pick up what was it one point in four games and we couldn't do that for the end of the Champions League if we would have played this way pragmatically against Red Bull Leipzig, we would have easily won that, right? We would have had loads of space as they would keep attacking. We would have defended well, kept our shape well, you know, t 10 men or 11 men behind the ball, whatever, and then hit them on the break. But we didn't do that. We couldn't even defend with five defend with seven defenders on the pitch. And now suddenly this is a great result because you drew 0-0. It's like, come on, man, get out of here. Um, a quote here from Shaw, he said, we, we said we needed to start brightly and we did and we did not, we could have been three or four down by 30 minutes. Ray Keane says, I've never seen so many hugs and chats after a dark game game. That's of the pictures, you know, were circulating around of Harry Maguire embracing John Stones after the game, which, you know, I guess they're England buddies. I guess maybe they came up. I don't know what what, what that was all about. Um, if anything, Harry Maguire had a pretty solid game, I thought. I think he was um, dealing with most of the threats going forward. Again, he doesn't have much, he didn't have much, um, he didn't have much to really worry about. Gabriel Jesus, I don't really rate too highly. I think if he wasn't Brazilian, people would be a lot more, you know, uh, people would be looking at him a little bit more with a detailed eye, but he tends to get away with it a little bit. His hold-up play isn't the best. Of course, you know, his finishing isn't the best either, so you don't really see where his sort of strengths are, but I guess because he's young and he's able to be a bit more mobile than a Serge, than a Kuna Aguero, he probably starts more often, and obviously Kuna Aguero has been injured too. So, but still... You know, you have to put performance in. So credit to Harry Maguire for doing so, but I thought that was odd. Another comment here from Michael Richards. It says, May not deserve credit for the way that they defended. I guess. Thanks. Roy Keane says, yeah, I won't play a video. I don't want to get blocked. He says, Roy Keane says, it's as if everyone was happy with the draw. I signed for Man United to win football matches, not to be happy or popular or friends with anybody. That I don't really make sense. That I understand. I don't really mind the idea of like being friends and stuff. It's just the approach to the game. I think we went into that game not wanting to be beat. We didn't want to get embarrassed. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was more worried about keeping his job than about us progressing up the table and, you know, beating our rivals and our in a local derby. But it is what it is. Another one here, you got a quote from Guardiola, so it's a good point. We cannot forget this is Old Trafford. It is a tough opponent. They press. They're so fast up front. It's Man United. Solskjaer says, we know the reasons why we have not started well. The lack of preseason we had, that is no cause of panic. So he's blamed the lack of preseason and he's also blamed, um, what was it earlier was that we're not fit enough, which is obviously the fault of the manager. The lack of preseason is supposed to be out of their hands. I think most people have had a preseason, most game, most teams. And also he blamed the lack of fans which most teams could say didn't have a lack of fans, right? It's like, what are you talking about? Uh, Roy King says, I'll give Ole until the end of the season. Look at it in the summer. He needs a trophy. Man United should not be celebrating top four. 100% agree. We can't turn into a banter club like Arsenal. Um, I would also agree to give Oli at least until the end of the season. I don't necessarily think... I don't necessarily think or believe the players deserve getting a new manager to get a boost up the table. I think these players have let down too many managers for, you know in too many consecutive seasons for it to be a thing of like, oh, a new coach comes in and he's suddenly going to make Luke Shaw into a worldie. I think some of these players are just dead, right? They're dead wood. They need to be moved on. They need to maybe be replaced or, you know, put in another position. I don't know, whatever it may be, but that needs to happen at the end. They need to ride out the season, the shame of finishing outside the top four, getting knocked out of the group stage of the Champions League. Let that cover over their heads. And then when a new manager gets hired, he can then come in and, of course, get rid of the Deadwood, the Rojos, the Phil Joneses, the Matters, the Lingard, the whoever else is there that we don't need get those players out to kind of free up the squad a bit and then sort of understand what we want to go going forward but I would give him until the end of the season of course but I don't think he's going to get a contract renewal anyway he doesn't deserve one to be honest Ole Gunnar Solskjaer considering what's going on um, Solskjaer says last season we won three games against City but it was mostly down to counter-attacking football and last ditch defending lucky moments too this season is the most control we've had against him control we didn't have any control. We defended well, but we didn't have any control. Let's let's be let's be chill. Let's chill out on there. Social on Paul said Paul has expressed his talent, did well, worked hard, and I'm happy with his contributions. You've got comment here from Gary Neville. He said Oli needed another centre back. Right, let me take off the screen. I don't want to get banned. He said Oli needed another centre back and he needed a winger. They're playing with Pogba on the left and Greenwood on the right. Square pegs and round holes all the time. Cool. That is true. But my issue with Oli is the fact that he obviously needs players to be successful. But we're owned by the Glazers. The Glazers obviously don't care about us being a good football team. 
they want to ensure that we are able to make the most money for them, which means finishing in the top four, Champions League football, good good cup runs, all that malarkey. If that's the case, and what we've seen, you know, in this past summer window, they obviously they didn't want to give them the money to buy all the players they needed. If you believe the reports, Oliver Gonsalves had a list of five players. He didn't get any of them, right? They were, all the players he got were like the second, third choices, whatever. Um, cool. If Oli needs players to be successful and the Glazers don't want to give him the money to buy these players, then we have to get another coaching who can operate under a limited budget and also coach players into good play, coach players into playing in the, into good football, right? Good system, good football, right? Whatever, you know what I mean? Sort of like what Klopp is doing at the moment, right? Klopp came into Liverpool and with a limited budget, he's been able to coach the players that he has and also been able to buy smart with people like Minamino, Shakiri, right? Players who, you know, are maybe not the most stellar names, but they do a good job for Liverpool when called upon. So I think that's what we basically need, which is why it probably makes sense why we should get someone like a Pochettino, because we're obviously operating under some restrictions. Another quote here from Gary Neville. Roy to Gary Neville says, you were the only right back at the club. We were stuck with you. as a little joke there. Roy Kinton Pogba said he doesn't want to run. I don't care about France. Eh, that's just a stick he has with it. Pogba wants to leave. Let him go. Pogba has left before and Man United survived. And Roy King said, another one. I've never wanted to leave Man United. I've never wanted to pay rise. Mick Richards said, you're the biggest contract in United. Roy King says, because I performed every week. So fair enough. Um, the pundits seem to be a bit split on who's to blame. It's interesting that Oli gets um, complete kid gloves with the media, isn't it? especially with all our ex-pundits. No one ever wants to come out and call a spade a spade and say, hey, um, you are not playing well, right? You are not performing at the level needed. Everyone just sort of like kind of uh, goes around in circles, says this, says that. It's like, get out of here, man. Get out of here. But hey, what can you do?